Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So one of the people that I loved watching on uh, TV when I was a teenager passed away this week, and uh, Samantha Falk, who uh, runs Samantha Falk Communications, she's a communications uh, public relations expert, who I had the pleasure of interviewing on about coaching and uh, the way that companies should be announcing coaching changes uh, previously, wrote that she had the opportunity to... Um, to meet Suzanne Summers and interview her previously. And, uh, and she talked about her experience and she, uh, and she talked about Suzanne Summers. And so I thought it'd be really fun to reach out to Samantha Falk to hear about her experience with Suzanne Summers. Uh, uh, Samantha, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back, Brian. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, and thanks for wearing the uniform today. Uh, <laughs> um, so tell me, uh, how did you meet Suzanne Summers? So it was, uh, it was about 20 years ago and I was hosting a health show called body and health. So my, in my previous career, before I started my own communications firm, I was a journalist and I worked for a lot of years in local news and national news. And I also hosted a national health show called body and health. And, uh, I got a wonderful opportunity to meet her and interview her about one of her books, uh, a long time ago. And I have to say, you know, I was, a sh- I did a post on LinkedIn about it. And I was ashamed to say, because I was so young at the time, I thought she was very old, <laughs> but she was probably 55, maybe. Uh, so very cruel of me. But uh, I got to spend probably an hour with her and her husband, Ellen Hamill. And tell me what the experience was like. You know, it was great. I, I'm also kind of ashamed to say that, you know, I remember Three's Company and I remember her being on TV, but I was I was pretty young. I kind of missed you know, missed it a little bit. So I knew who she was, but by that time she'd reinvented herself into a health guru. So she was very into, you know, clean eating and exercising. Of course, everybody remembers her for the thigh master. So she, uh, she reinvented herself. And I, and I talked about this in my post that she really had to, because her life changed radically in 1980 when she made the outrageous demand to be paid the same as her co-star John Ritter. And so I, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, tell me. So she, you said that she was making 30,000 bucks an episode while John Ritter was making five times that at 150,000 bucks. Exactly. So at the time, in 1980, it, Three's Company, the show she started, was the number one show on TV. They were heading into their fifth season. She made one fifth of what her co star did. And arguably, she was more famous, you know, I think maybe a little bit. John Ritter for sure was loved, but so was Suzanne Summers. So she was entering into contract renegotiations and she demanded wage parity. She wanted to be the same, paid the same as John Ritter. And so how ABC, her network at the time, uh, responded to that was to squeeze her out of the show, cut her out of scenes and fire her eventually. And it's really terrible. So, and she, not only did she get fired from Three's Company, not make the same money as John Ritter, she was vilified in Hollywood. She was, you know, labeled as difficult and a diva and all those things that women sometimes are labeled for demanding what they deserve. You know, I watch Three's Companies a lot, maybe not religiously, but a lot. Um, uh, I don't even remember John Ritter. <laughs> exactly my point, Right. Suzanne she Summers was the franchise. Name. She was. She was. I mean, nobody, I'm, I would probably argue that nobody had posters of John Ritter in their room, right? But everybody, every, you know, young, young man in North America probably had a Suzanne Summers poster. There we go. See? So, so why was it? Was it, was, was Hollywood just a very different world then? Well, I'd like to say it was a very different world, but I don't think it's entirely different. You know, I did some research into this. And in 1980, uh, women on average were making 64% of what men men make in society. You know, Suzanne Summers was making even less than that. She, you know, significantly less than that. But we still don't have wage parity in 2023. We're still making on average 90% of what men make. So was Hollywood a different place? Probably, because I think there's a lot of uh, powerful females in Hollywood and making the same as their male co-stars. But I also do remember there's been many cases in recent years of of women stars demanding to be paid the same as their male co-stars. Sometimes they have larger roles, even. Uh, it's still it's still not equal. 
Well, you know, I think it was announced this week that Taylor Swift uh, just became a billionaire with her music and uh, went through a whole bunch of other people that become billionaires and none of them became billionaires through their music. They had to go off into other things, perfume or, or fashion or something else to actually make their billion. And so she's actually making the money uh, from her uh, her talent. Uh, um, not that there's anything wrong with coming up with a perfume line or a fashion line, but uh, from actual uh, talent. Uh, and and some people are saying this is the biggest tour in history. Ever. That- and well, Taylor Swift is brilliant because she owns everything now. She controls it. She decides when to release her music. She no longer is at uh, the the behest of a of a record company. She's she's in charge, and she's a super businesswoman. So fantastic. Well, maybe that's just one example, but doesn't that suggest that male or female, the females can can carry their own? Ab- absolutely, they can carry their own, but often that it doesn't happen. So. I'm just, I just, uh, I kind of reframe my memories of Suzanne Summers as, uh, as her not just being, you know, a superstar and a health guru, but also an equal pay pioneer, someone who really pushed um, women to be paid what they deserve. And what about your, it, what about your own personal experience in uh, in communications, media, in Canada? A uh, great question. I absolutely think in in the course of my career, I was paid less than than men doing exactly the same job as I was. Really? And yeah. and do you think that would continue today? Well, I wouldn't accept that today, but I'm a different person than I was when I started 20 years ago. <laughs> but do you think it's still present? Is there still an issue? I think it's better. Uh, for sure, it's improved over, over the course, you know, since 1980. Um, but I still think there's room for more improvement. So the other issue that, uh, you know, Suzanne Summers has, has been mentioned on, you didn't, but uh, other people mentioned it is that, uh, you know, men can be Hollywood stars into their 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and it's more challenging for females. Uh, so, so youth and beauty is is a is a far more important, or at least it's perceived to be a far more important quality for female actresses, uh, et cetera, than it is men with silver can still be, I guess, attractive. You're, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, some women have the audacity to age. <laughs> you know, can you imagine where, you know, George Clooney, how old is George Clooney now? Probably pushing 60. He's still considered to be, you know, one of the most handsome men in Hollywood. Um, but a woman pushing 60, would she be still uh, revered as beautiful? Probably not. Has that changed or is that the same as it's always been? I, I think... Um, you know, I think it's changed a little bit for sure. I think there's there's women out there who are really vocal about, you know, being 50 and 50 plus and looking great. And, um, you know, 50 is the new 40 and 40 is the new 30 and all that sort of stuff. So things have definitely evolved a bit, but not to the same degree as men. You're right. Men men can can age and, and it's all good. <laughs> so two of the other issues that, uh, you know, Suzanne Summers has been known for is, is health, as you mentioned but also breast cancer. And so maybe we could take a break uh, for some messages uh, and then come back after the break and talk to you, Samantha, about those two issues. Sounds great. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Samantha Falk. Uh, she is a communications media expert. Uh, she is in Vancouver. Uh, she runs her own company, uh, Samantha Falk uh, Company, uh, and helps companies, uh, people, uh, organizations uh, amplify their stories of mission-driven brands is your tagline. What does that mean? Oh, you know, I really love working with people and companies and brands that want to make the world a better place in some way. And so my clients are all fantastic and all doing very different and diverse things. Um, And it's a pleasure to help them try to get their messages out. Fantastic. Well, I guess Suzanne Summers tried to do that with her uh, health and wellness business. Tell us a little bit about that. Thigh Master is the is the big issue. That <laughs> Thigh Master was the huge one. And I just realized that, you know, we're both wearing pink. It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So, um, you know, hopefully people are, are you know, if, if there is a positive thing to come out of Suzanne Summers passing away from breast cancer is that people start thinking about getting mammograms and taking care of their health and being proactive uh, about all those issues. So, yeah, she had breast cancer for 23 years. And clearly she lived a, a really healthy life, really believed in, you know, like clean eating and exercise and, um, and she thrived for a very long time, but her breast cancer came back a few months ago. And I think, uh, 
and she just couldn't beat it this time. She was almost 77. She died. She died the day before her 77th birthday, but she lived with breast cancer for more than two decades. That's incredible. And I, I heard that she became, I read that she became very good friends uh, with Olivia and John uh, through their common challenges with breast cancer. Yeah. yeah. So oh, I, I really believe she's created a lot of awareness for that issue. And hopefully women are taking care of themselves and men too. 1% of breast cancer victims are men. So it's something that everybody should be aware of. What What's the key there? Is it uh, the regular detection? Absolutely. I think, yeah, that's something. And it's all, it's something I can speak from personal experience. I'm always terrified to get a mammogram. Uh, it's, it's scary because you're afraid you're going to find something, but of course that's the point of it. You know, early detection is key. So don't be afraid to get a mammogram and, and do self exams regularly. Talk to your doctor. Don't be shy. This is really, really important. You know, I had my own personal experience. Uh, I had, um, believe it or not, a, a breast cancer scare. Um, uh, they, uh, the right. my physician, uh, found a lump, um, and, uh, and I was amazed at how quickly, uh, the healthcare system responded, uh, within, uh, you know, a very, I think it was three or four days I was in for a mammogram, uh, and an ultrasound. Um, uh, and then, um, I guess they found out that it wasn't, and it took forever for me to actually get the result, uh, that was, oh. uh, to, to say, don't worry. Uh, but when they were worried, they responded, uh, unbelievably quickly. Uh, and it was, um. It was impressive that they responded as quickly. I just wish they would have told me, told you sooner, told me well, sooner I'm... what the news was. But I guess when they found out that uh, it was uh, something different, they didn't need to get back to me. But, but, but I had the, the pleasure, not, uh, not at all, of going and having a mammogram, which was really quite, uh, you know, if men understood how uncomfortable that was, they'd have a little bit more understanding and sympathy for you all. Well, I'm thrilled to hear that you're okay. Um, mammograms are definitely uncomfortable, not my favorite thing, but very necessary. So do not be deterred from getting one. And Brian, good for you for speaking out that about, about your own experience, because that's really important. Many men don't even realize it's a possibility for them. I, I did when, when, when I found the lump and then talked to my physician about it, I said, is it even possible? And I said, of course it's possible. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and she, uh, inspected it and, uh, rushed me in for, uh, for the test. And thankfully it was, it was something different, but, uh, you know, that was, that was interesting. Uh, what about health and health and, and wellness and, and, and beauty is, is that a, an occupation that you can be proud of? Is that something that she changed? Like five masters, I guess, is something that people think of as important. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about Thigh Master for a while. I think, you know, everyone had that gadget in the in the 80s and 90s, probably. Did everyone? Oh, I, I didn't actually, but, but probably many people because she ended up making $300 million from Thigh Master alone. And she started off as just a spokesperson for the brand, but she ended up buying it and owning it. And so again, another incredible, you know, business decision that clearly paid off if uh, it was worth, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars by the end of that. Um, but she also, you know, she wrote, she wrote 23, 23 or 27, 27 books, I think, you know, 14 of them were bestsellers about beauty, about taking care of yourself. And, you know, I think a lot of people dismiss those kinds of things as being very superficial, but I'm definitely a believer. And if you, if you, you know, feel good, that helps your psychology, it helps your outlook on life. Um, so taking care of yourself, I think is an important step in, in mental health and in overall wellness. And so I'm not going to discount that. And 14 bestsellers is nothing to sneeze at. 27 books and 14 uh, bestsellers is certainly nothing to uh, sneeze at. And I read another article that said that, you know, is a little bit ironic that she was so successful as an author. They weren't ghost written. They were written by her. Um, and that she in her role was the ditzy dumb blonde. That's right. That's right. No, she, she was, uh, I remember from interviewing her, she was, you know, she was a bit of a tough cookie. She definitely knew which side, you know, I don't, I don't know my good side or my bad side, but I, she was in control of that. She knew which side she wanted to be shot from. Um, you know, she was very, very much uh, a controller of her own image. You know, she, she took care of herself. So, uh, and she was, she was no dumb blonde. That's for sure. He was no dumb blonde. That's uh, for sure. But it was also a great show. Um, you know, you said that you didn't watch it a lot, but it was really a funny, great show. And, um, and in her way, she put chauvinistic men, um, the landlord, uh, for one, um, in their place in a very funny, interesting way. Awesome. Good. 
I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't remember that. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now impossibly old, but at the time I was really young and I don't quite remember it. Well, the, I think the, I land, the landlord, whose name up. I can't remember right now, but the landlord was a very chauvinistic uh, uh, gentleman and, uh, and, and Suzanne found a way, Suzanne Summers found a way to, to put him in his place on a very regular basis. But also just the fact that, you know, you had three people uh, living together and uh, not in a, in a, in a romantic or sexual relationship, just as friends, I think was also sort of, uh, something strange for the time and new for the time. Right. That men and women could be friends. <laughs> exactly. Can men and women be friends? Of course. Of course they can. And can a blonde be intelligent? <laughs> I'm not even going to answer that. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response, Brian. <laughs> Suzanne, Suzanne Summers and you have certainly proved that that's, uh, that's possible. There's no <laughs> question about it. Um, what's going to be your memory of your meeting with Suzanne Summers? You know, I remember a few things. Uh, I mentioned this in the post. I remember her husband, Alan Hamill, uh, get, grabbing some nuts from the mini bar and then seeing how much they cost and complaining about it and putting them back. You know, you know how mini bar nuts are like $15 or whatever. Uh, and I remember thinking that's funny because even at the time I knew that they were quite wealthy. So, you know, I thought, you yeah, know, what's $15 for nuts? Um, I remember that she, she really, you know, she knew her stuff. Uh, she really wanted to talk about the book and the content and she really, you know, she was great at that. Um, she definitely knew the power of TV and interview and self-promotion. Uh, it was a really, it was a really fun encounter. You've had the experience of meeting some interesting people in your career, I can imagine. Oh, I definitely have. Yes. Other than her, who were the top two or three? Oh my goodness. Um, I loved meeting Jane Goodall, who is one of my heroes. She's uh, done so much incredible work. But as far in the celebrity sphere, who uh, who who would be in my top? Um, I oh, I interviewed the Red Hot Chili Peppers a couple of times. <laughs> I've uh, I've interviewed so many people. You know, I interviewed Justin Trudeau back when he was a teacher in Vancouver, and not our not our Prime Minister. Oh, some people um, would be interested in your stories for that. Yeah, no, I've interviewed him a few times, well before he went into politics. Um, who else? Oh, honestly, Brian, I've interviewed so many people. I'm trying to remember the highlights. Who did I? Who did I love meeting? Great question. I'll have to go. I need more time to think about that. Well, I'm uh, at a thousand five hundred interviews and a thousand episodes, and I think you're a thousand five or something like that of my episodes, and a thousand five hundred and five of my interviewees. So I've interviewed a few people as well. Um, uh, but I really appreciate you joining us. And uh, you know, the the last time we chatted, when you talked about uh, how to fire someone. Um, and <laughs> and fire them correctly, I thought was really or incorrectly was really kind of uh, of interesting, um, um, and um, and I really enjoyed your post about Suzanne Summers, and that's why I wanted to reach out to you because I think that a lot of people, um, you know, remember people just for the thing they were the most famous for, but forget some of the other things. And uh, I think her health and wealth uh, business, um, uh, the fact that she bought Thymaster and made three hundred million dollars. Uh, from it, um, that uh, she's written so many books and that 14 of them were bestsellers, um, that she fought for pay equity, um, that she had a long, happy uh, marriage, um, you know, I think are all interesting facts that have come out. And I enjoyed uh, some of the articles that talked about uh, how she was very smart um, and people didn't give her credit for that. Um, and that she formed this incredible friendship and support network with Olivia Newton-John and I presume other people in regards to uh, to breast cancer and and promotion, as you said, of uh, of uh, early detection and uh, and regular uh, mammograms, et cetera. So it's important to remember people in all of the facets of their life rather than just in the ditzy blonde Dylan Three's company. I couldn't agree with you more. Very well said. Samantha Falk, thanks so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a break and come back with another interesting story just after the break in two minutes. Stay with us, everybody.